Hi, everybody. So um, we're going to start the math part of the course by looking at maybe the most basic and fundamental example of a machine learning algorithm in the sense that's a very fancy name for this, but it fits. Uh, and that's linear regression. So you've all probably um, seen linear regression in some form or other in science classes or somewhere in your previous, uh, maybe even in, uh, in mathematics. And linear regression arises with the in the following situation. We, um, we do an experiment or collect data in some other setting where we, exp where we have a, something that we consider an independent variable and something that we consider a dependent variable. And we imagine or have reason to believe that there's a linear relationship between the dependent and independent variable. So in this example, we've done a physics experiment and We've me measured the distance from where we are to a moving object. And these points here correspond to the, uh, to the distance measurements as a function of time. And because the object is moving at a constant rate, we expect these points to fall on a line. But because of measurement error, they don't. Uh, there's some error, and so they sort of cluster around a line, but they don't actually lie on a line. And the question we would want to find is, what's the best line that captures the slope of these points. And in other words, maybe what's the best estimate of the velocity of this particle that we're measuring? So uh, that's one example of a problem that you might solve by linear regression. Um, and another, maybe a slightly more interesting problem, uh, comes from this data set, which we'll probably look at in the labs. Uh, this comes from the University of California at Irvine database of machine learning data sets. And it has a bunch of information about cars that dates back to the 1980s. So it's pretty out of date now, but uh, it's still fun to play with. And I've extracted from that data set, the, each of these points is a car model. And I've plotted for each car model, the size of its engine, the engine displacement, which is measured usually in cubic centimeters. So big numbers mean big engines and the miles per gallon that a car gets. So not surprisingly, cars which have smaller engines get better gas mileage. And as the engine size goes up, the um, gas mileage goes down, but it's an inexact relationship. And there are cars, for example, which have small engines and poor gas mileage, like this one here, and cars which have considerably bigger engines and still have quite good gas mileage, like this car here. But overall, the, um, there's a downward slope, and the red line here I've put up above, uh, the slope is negative 0.06x plus 35.117. And the way you would interpret that is that each additional cubic centimeter of displacement costs you six one hundredths of a mile per gallon. Or if you want, every hundred additional cubic centimeters costs you six miles per gallon. And that's uh, basically what the slope of this line tells you. And the question we want to ask is how do we, what's the criteria, what's a criterion we can use for finding a line which best captures this data? And um, that's the problem that we're going to, that often goes by the name linear regression or sometimes least squares and sometimes just to distinguish this particular application of least squares from other ones, ordinary least squares, or OLS. So um, we're given data points, x i y i, let's say big N of them. And we want to find uh, we, we, we want to find a slope and intercept so that yi is approximately mxi plus b for i equals 1 up to n. Uh, 
we can't have equals because the points don't lie on a line, but we want to do the best we can. Um, and so what is the best we can? Well, for that, uh, we introduce what's called the mean squared error. So the mean squared error for a choice of slope and intercept is the average of the squared difference between yi, which is the measured value, and mx plus b, which is the predicted value. So we think about yi as being mxi plus b plus an error term. This is the error term. And we take we square it, which means that um, positive and negative errors both count positively. And, um, and then we take the average. Um, and that's the uh, what we're going to introduce for our for our uh, um, measurement of error. Now, there's actually some very good reasons coming out of probability theory for why one should use this as an error, but it's not the only possible choice. You could, for instance, take the absolute value or some other uh, criterion for error, and you would get a different answer. And generally speaking, in machine learning algorithms, the choice of the error that you're going to try to minimize has a big effect on the solution to the problem. But as I said, we're sticking to the simplest case, so we're going to work with uh, the one where the problem is easiest to solve, and that's the mean squared error. So we're going to say that the best choice of m and b are the values that minimize the mean squared error. And we're going to use calculus to find these values. Namely, we're going to take the partial derivatives of the mean squared error and with respect to m and b and set it equal to 0. So we're going to find partial derivative. Let me simplify mean squared error and just write e. Little less writing. So the partial derivative of e with respect to m equal to 0 and the partial derivative of e with respect to b equals 0 we'll find to find the minimum. And it's worth thinking about this for a minute. I mean, this function, the, the MSE, looks complicated because it's got the sum in it. But these yi's and xi's are constants. They're the given data points. So the only this is really only has two variables, m and b. And if you were to expand this out and collect all the terms together, uh, you would have a, the, the highest power of m or b you would get would be a quadratic function. So in fact, this is a quadratic function of m and b. It looks something like a m squared plus capital B M B plus capital C B squared plus capital D M plus capital E B plus capital F. Where A, B, C, D, E, and F are some constants that involve the Y's and the X's. Now, we're not going to actually compute the A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. We're just going to go ahead and compute the partial derivatives. So let's look first at the partial derivative of E with respect to M. So since E is 1 over N sum Yi minus Mxi minus B squared, the partial derivative of E with respect to M is uh, 1 over n. The derivative of a sum is just the sum of the derivatives, so we take the derivative of each term. Each term is a square, so we have 2 times yi minus mxi minus b. But then we have to use the chain rule, and we have to pull out the coefficient of m, which is minus xi. 
And um, we can rearrange this a little bit for reasons that will make the later solution easier. Let's factor out the 2 and write this as 2 times the sum as i goes from 1 to n of uh, factor out minus 2 of y i x i minus m x i squared minus b x i. So I pulled out the 2 and the 1 over n and the minus sign, and I'm left with x i y i m x i squared and b x i. And then we can group together the, the sums here, and this is minus 2 times 1 over n sum of y i x i minus m times 1 over n sum of x i squared minus b times 1 over n sum of x i. And let's call 1 over n sum of x i y i s x y. And let's call 1 over n sum of x i squared s x x. And let's call 1 over n sum of x i just x bar, which is the average value of the x's. And so then in that case, the partial derivative of e with respect to m works out to be minus 2 times sxy minus msxx minus bx bar. And we're going to want to set that equal to 0. Now let's do the partial derivative of e with respect to b. So we have, again, e sum from 1 to n, 1 over n, um, y i minus m x i minus b squared. So the partial derivative of e with respect to b is 1 over n times the sum from 1 to n of 2 y i minus m x i minus b. And now the chain rule just gives us a minus 1, which is the coefficient of b. And so this is minus 2 times the sum from 1 to n of um, yi. Let's do it this way. Let me, uh, let me start again there. So it's minus 2 over n times the sum of yi. Minus m times the sum of xi, minus b times the sum of 1. There's a 1 in front of each b. Or in other words, it's minus 2 times the 1 over n times the sum of yi, minus m times 1 over n times the sum of xi, minus b, because there's n terms here, so the sum of 1 from 1 to n is just 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times, and then we're dividing by n, so the n cancels out. And if we add to our notation y bar is 1 over n sum of yi, then this, um, this equation becomes minus 2 times y bar minus m x bar minus b, and that's supposed to equal 0. So to put all the pieces together, we have this equation and this equation. And let's um, put them together. We can throw away the minus 2s, and so we have y bar equals m x bar plus b, that's the first equation, and s x y equals m s x x plus b x bar.
And this is two equations and two unknowns, the unknowns being the variables m and b. And uh, we can solve this, for example, to get, we can multiply the first equation by x bar, and we would get x bar y bar equals mx bar squared plus bx bar and subtract these two to get sxy minus x bar y bar equals m times sxx minus x bar squared, or m equals sxy minus x bar y bar over sxx minus x bar squared. And if you want to get b, um, you go back to your first two equations. Here, let's, uh, here's one solution. And then the second solution, we take, uh, we want m, so, I mean, sorry, we want uh, b, so we multiply the first equation, we multiply this equation by x bar, so we get x bar sxy equals m x bar sxx plus b x bar squared, and we multiply um, the first equation by sxx, and we get sxxy bar equals m x bar um, sxx plus b sxx, and then we subtract again the two equations to get um, x bar sxy minus y bar sxx equals b times x bar squared minus sxx. And if you put that together and switch some signs around to make the denominators match up, you get uh, this equation for b. So these gives you the, um, in terms of the sums of the various products and the averages of the variables that you've got, this gives you the, um, the formula for the line of best fit. And maybe in conclusion, the only thing we should watch out for is this denominator. Uh, the denominator better not be zero. Well, what happens if it is zero? How could that happen? Well, you have to remember what these things are. SXX is one over N sum XI squared, and X bar squared is the sum of XI, one over N squared. So for these two things to be equal, we would need to have N times the sum of XI squared equals sum of xi squared. And the, that happens if all the xi are equal. This is true. And in fact, that's the only way it can be true. Um, To see that, uh, you can use a little bit of vector calculus. Namely, you can let, let's let x be the vector x1 up to xn, and let's let e be the vector 1 out to 1. Then the, the sum, the norm of x squared is the sum of xi squared the norm of e squared is n, because it's 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is n. 
And the sum of xi squared is the absolute value of the dot product of x and e. Because x dotted with e, sorry, the norm, yeah, it, um, x squared. x dotted with e is the sum of the xi's, and then you square it. And there's a theorem known as the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. which says that if you have two vectors, the dot product, the absolute value of the dot product of two vectors is less than or equal to the product of the norms of the vectors with equality only if A is a multiple of B. And in three dimensions or two dimensions, this is basically we know that a dot b is the length of a times the length of b times the cosine of the angle between them. So this is amounts to saying that the cosine of the angle between them is less than one. But it's true in higher dimensions as well. And um, if you apply that to our situation, you see that the norm of x dot e squared well, or I mean, I'm going to square both sides, is less than or equal to the norm of x squared, the norm of e squared. And that means that's what we're trying to show. Uh, the equality happens only if x is a multiple of e. And that would mean since e is 1, 1, 1, that would happen only if all of the xi's were equal to lambda. They'd all be equal. But what would it mean if they were all equal? It would mean that our data set um, has only one, I mean, has, so to speak, has only one x. And um, if you think about graphing it, if all the x's are the same, and then you have a bunch of y's, uh, your line of best fit is going to be vertical. So the slope's clearly going to be undefined. And um, that's what the uh, formulas here are telling you, that you better have at least two different x's or uh, your formulas aren't going to work. So that's a pretty minor uh, a pretty minor problem. You probably, if you're, all your x's were the same, you probably wouldn't be trying to do linear regression anyway. So... Um, that finishes our uh, introduction to this very basic type of uh, data analysis.